Hi, and welcome back. Let's start with the question, what's actually the difference between dynamic and condenser mics? No, condenser mics don't pick up more background noise. Not really. For that to be actually true, the condenser mics would have to be compressing the dynamic range somehow, or else the dynamic mics be expanding it. There are two reasons why it's kind of a bit true in practice. Mostly it's because dynamic mics are typically designed to be used closer to the source, while a condenser is typically deployed a bit further away, possibly behind a pop shield. And the other reason is simply that the extended bandwidth from a condenser mic might make the background noises seem clearer and more noticeable, especially if they have significant high-frequency content. So, what's actually the difference? Well, a dynamic mic capsule measures the air movement, while a condenser mic capsule measures the air pressure. Dynamic mics are velocity transducers, in other words, while condenser mics are pressure transducers. So why does that matter? Well, a velocity transducer produces its maximum output when the air is moving fastest. But that's not when the pressure is maximum. That's when the pressure is increasing most rapidly. When the pressure reaches its maximum, that's when the velocity has dropped to zero and is about to reverse direction. What does that look like on a graph? Well, the top sine wave is the velocity, while the bottom one is pressure. Yes, that's right, they're 90 degrees out of phase. If you line up a condenser mic and a dynamic mic such that both have their capsules the exact same distance from the source, they won't be in phase, there will be a 90 degree phase difference between them. I know, right? Mind blown. If you're wondering how the hell you didn't know that already, and you're feeling rather sceptical, I'll put a link in the video description to the DPA website for a higher authority. There's no doubt the DPA people know more about how microphones work than I do. And if you're still wondering how you didn't know, well, I was at least 10 years into my career before I found out, and I felt just as horrified as you that it wasn't more widely known. Funny story, I was once freelancing as house engineer at a local venue, just there to mix monitors for the supports. And there was an intern there as well, shadowing the venue's technical manager. The intern was asking lots of questions, and being a little bored, I was more than happy to info-dump. So when he asked about the difference between dynamics and condensers, I launched into a lecture on the difference between pressure and velocity transducers. I'd just got to the bit where I said that an omnidirectional condenser mic is basically just a high-resolution barometer, and suddenly realised the touring crew and the tech manager had all stopped what they were doing and were listening open-mouthed in disbelief. As a lowly house engineer, it's not always wise to know too much more than the touring engineers that are nominally your bosses. They spent the rest of the show furiously telling me how wrong I was. Anyway, if you line up a condenser mic perfectly with a dynamic mic, they're not in phase. Sorry, don't shoot the messenger. A couple of important points, though. Crucially, this is not a timing difference. The phase difference does not depend on the frequency. There will be no comb filtering artefacts, just a constant 90 degree phase difference over the whole spectrum. And a 90 degree phase difference is actually quite benign. The signals will add together almost as perfectly as if they were perfectly in phase. You need to get quite close to 180 degrees of phase shift before cancellation suddenly becomes a big problem. But also, because it's not a timing difference, you can't correct for it by adjusting the relative distance of the mics. You could get one specific frequency in phase, but then all the rest would start to comb filter due to the timing difference. From a more philosophical perspective, this is a devastating blow to the pedants that pop up when someone refers to flipping the phase to say, You mean polarity, not phase. Phase is about timing. Well, clearly it isn't about timing. The same signal arrives at two mic capsules at the same time, but the resulting pressure and velocity measurements are 90 degrees apart in phase. As a wise man once said, Delay always means phase shift, but phase shift does not always mean delay. So here's a sine wave I'm generating in reactor. And I'm going to try to demonstrate that all possible phases of this sine wave are already encoded within it and can be derived without the use of delay. First of all, at risk of stating the obvious, we can simply flip the polarity, like so. This wave is upside down relative to the original, so we've achieved 180 degrees of phase shift. OK, big deal, I hear you say. Polarity inversion is a special case. What about all the other phases? Well then, next step is to grab a single sample delay module, which Reactor calls a unit delay. Wait, I thought we weren't using delay. 
Well, no, we're not really. This is a 100 hertz sign, which with a sample rate of 48k means 480 samples for a full cycle. Achieving 180 degrees of phase shift would require 240 samples of delay. 90 degrees of phase shift would mean 120 samples of delay. This is just one sample, nowhere near enough to shift the phase significantly. So don't think of it as a delay, really. Think of it as the delta, the smallest unit of time available to us. Furthermore, the signal isn't actually going to run through it as such. Rather, the unit delayed signal gets used in parallel. I'm going to grab a subtract module and subtract that previous sample from the current sample. Which, if you think about it, that gives us the rate of change, right? The faster the values are increasing, the larger this signal will be. And if the values are decreasing, this will go negative. It starts off pretty small, though, so let's boost it up a fair bit with a multiply module. It amuses me slightly that 69 appears to be the correct scalar value for a 100 hertz sine wave. I promise I didn't plan that. And let's see how that looks on the scope. Well, would you look at that? It's a sine wave again, but with a 90 degree phase shift. And this is basically the same difference as between the dynamic and condenser capsules. If the top trace is the air pressure, then the one below is the rate of change in air pressure, which means velocity. OK, we're getting closer, but we're still not quite there. We can get 180 degrees by inverting, 90 degrees by calculating the rate of change, and 270 degrees by inverting that. But what about all the in-between phases? OK, here's a reactor scanner module, which is basically a crossfade for more than two signals. Let's hook up our four signals, the original sign, the 90 degree shifted sign, the 180 inverted sign, and the 270 degree sign. With the scanner knob at zero, we have just the original sine wave. Check. As I turn it up, we start to crossfade to the 90 degree sign, and the result of the crossfade smoothly morphs from zero to 90 degrees phase shift. If I keep going and start to crossfade from 90 to 180, the result morphs from 90 to 180 degrees. And when I go above 270, the scanner wraps around and crossfades back to the first input. So this knob gives us 360 degrees of continuous phase shift, all derived from that original sine wave using simple maths and with no delay, because we already established that a single sample delay that's inverted and run in parallel doesn't count. My conclusion, it's not possible to shift the timing of a waveform without also affecting its phase, but it is absolutely possible to shift the phase of a waveform without affecting its timing. And that's why a filter can shift the phase in either direction without needing to see into the future. I'll say it again, delay always means phase shift, but phase shift does not always mean delay. Maybe I should get that printed on a t-shirt. That's all. Thanks for watching.